All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session where we're going to talk about the future of data infrastructure. Uh, we're also going to take some time talking about founders' advice, since our two panelists here today are extremely qualified to discuss uh, both these um, topics. Uh, my name is Denise Pearson, and I'm the CMO um, at Snowflake, and I'm very excited to introduce our panelists for today. We have um, in the middle, we have um, Spencer Kimball, founder and CEO of Cockroach Labs. And uh, to the right, we have Emil Afram, founder and CEO of um, Neo4j. Uh, welcome, and uh, most importantly, how are you both today? Let's start with Emil. I, from what I understand, you're in the south of Sweden, Malmo or Copenhagen East as we also call it. How, how are things in uh, Malmo today? They are fantastic. Uh, we are almost uh, COVID recovered, I dare to say. Uh, the latest seven day tail tailing uh, death count is now at zero, right? Uh, and the weather is beautiful for Sweden, so it's all good. Great, great to hear that. And Spencer, uh, you are in um, you're in downtown New York, right? You are in NoHo, if I if I'm uh, correct. That's correct, and uh, I think we're also somewhat COVID recovered here. I don't think it's quite as good as Sweden, but uh, New York's got some of its old energy back, minus the tourists. Yeah, we really all need some um, you know great news at this time. So I think we, we have a few things in common, but uh, one of them is that we all have quite unusual you know, company names. And I think the audience might be interested in hearing the background you know, on these names. So can we start with you, uh, Spencer? Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, so Cockroach, before it was a company, was really just sort of a manifesto uh, post my 10 years at Google. I left in 2012, it was uh, a little bit, uh, I'd say disappointing what the state of open source databases were compared to what Google had been developing for the past 10 years. And so the idea of an open source spanner really uh, loomed large. And I kind of have a, um, a dark sense of humor. And <laughs> it uh, did it occur to me that the idea that would make sense would be a lot of sort of independent nodes that would colonize the available disk space and sort of greedily optimize, make sure everything was replicated and totally survivable. And you know, I live in New York, so uh, <laughs> the idea of cockroaches was uh, something that appealed to me. Uh, and now I spend time in all kinds of meetings with CIOs, uh, Fortune 10 companies even, uh, explaining the name and it's a good icebreaker, uh, but you know, nobody ever forgets it. And it is evocative, right? This is a database that survives. Yeah, and you have you have mascots in the office too. <laughs> we we call our employees roachers. So you know, if you if you have a weird name like this, you really have to lean into it. <laughs> yeah, but there's a little bit of that dark dark side in the Neo for J name too. No, no, it's all it's all light and sunshine. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, initially. Like we, when we when we built uh, Neo4j, the the database, it was an internal project, and we called it Project Neo, because it was a new view of data, and Neo means new in Latin. Um, also, uh, this was way back when dinosaurs ruled the earth in the early two thousands, and I was a big fan then and am today of the Matrix movies. And you have the main character, Neo, who's fighting against the Matrix. And a Matrix, you can visualize as a table, right? And so that was that. Um, but then when we wanted to actually spin it out and make a separate company out of it, um, we, we tried to get the Neo.com domain name. But it was outrageously expensive. It was uh, $2,000. Um, and, and, and we grew up in the, in the Java community. Um, and at the time there's this thing where you call things 4J, right? So there's a logging framework. You called it logging 4J, log 4J. And one of my co-founders, he said, let's just use Neo4J. And it doesn't really make sense. What does Neo for Java even mean? But the domain name was $9. So we could afford it barely. Um, one thing led to the other, and I now run a company with a name that sounds like a password. 
Cool. And uh, well, the story behind Snowflake is that our founders are big skiers. There are two, we have two French founders. They're um, yeah, big skiers, so they love snowflakes. Uh, also, snowflake uh, is sort of built, you know, born in the cloud, and you know, snowflakes, you know, they they come from the cloud too. And also, um, our founders felt that it was very easy for them to pronounce snowflake too. Uh, they're French, so that that was also another important, you know, criteria. So that's um, the main uh, story behind the snowflake um, name as well. So our first topic is really about you know, how to prepare for the future when it comes to data infrastructure. And I think there are a couple of things that are clear to everyone attending this conference. Number one is, yes, you know, everything is moving to the cloud. And number two, you know, data is becoming a strategic asset to every company. And we're also in the midst of a big generational shift when it comes to uh, data infrastructure. So most companies at this time are in a situation where big decisions uh, need to be made for the future. And that future is not you know, five years from now, right? Most companies are already you know, falling behind and need to move you know, quickly. And on, on this uh, conference here, we have a lot of, of founders that need to make decisions in regards to data infrastructure for their company. So, um, so the first topic is really about, you know, when everything is moving to the cloud now, you know, what are the uh, requirements and um, considerations, right, that decision makers need to consider at this um, time? Do you want to start, um, Spencer? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think the the you know the the present as opposed to even the future is the cloud. Uh, I think it, it sort of makes sense initially when people think of the cloud to do the same things that they were doing previously, sort of the as sort of the lift and shift model. Um, but when you really look at uh, what the cloud is offering, there's a uh, an opportunity to exploit the resources it's giving you. And I think of the cloud as as being a sort of a frictionless way to uh, acquire. Uh, what used to take months and, and uh, you know, you'd have to buy machines, put them into a co-location facility. Uh, and, and many companies still operate on that basis. They have their own private data centers and things. Uh, the cloud makes it so you can get these things programmatically in minutes, sometimes even seconds. Uh, and it's not just within a data center. It's, a, it's across data centers in a region and it's across regions on, on a continent. It's across continents, right? So you really want to think about if you're going to use the cloud, it's not just about lift and shift. Hey, someone else is handling the data centers. It's really, we can build different things, not just faster, but better. We can build global services. We can push things to the edge. And I think that's really what I think about uh, for the future. But, you know, fundamentally, this is about how do we change our business by, you know, fundamentally exploiting the benefits of the cloud? And that requires new infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, Mel. Yeah, I, I for sure agree with that. I, I think there's always a ton of stuff you can you can talk about here uh, when you talk about kind of requirements and consideration um, for, for this. I think the only one thing, the high order bit that I would add is there's a very interesting interplay right now going on between independent technology companies like our three companies and, and the cloud platforms, right? And obviously very self-serving for any one of the three of us here to claim that you should not go with a cloud platform specific service. You should always go with the independent one. Of course, we're going to feel that way because we are those independent vendors. But I just I would add that at least as a, a, an important consideration, right? Like you can use uh, a service that is native to whichever cloud platform you, you deploy to. And there can be many advantages to that where it's more plugged into other services and so on and so forth, right? You do end up becoming more coupled to that to that platform, right? And so, just being aware of the of the trade offs there uh, would be uh, like a high order bit for me to add. Yeah, so both of you, I mean, the cross cloud that's something you see as an important requirement among your among your customers at this time, or yeah, fundamentally, I mean, uh, the global two thousands or the enterprise segment, uh, they they I think are almost allergic to what you know, is known as vendor concentration risk. So you know, it's one thing for a startup that, uh, especially in the last five, 10 years, to come to the public cloud, something like AWS, you know, that was you know, the, the integrated ecosystem that AWS provides is, is actually an asset. Uh, you have, uh, I hate to use this 
phrase, but one vendor throat to choke, right? And an integrated billing, you just get one bill and, you know, uh, uh, things are, the services are hooked up with the identity access management. Everything sort of works together. So that's, 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 a, that, that's a, a big win or it has been a big win. Uh, when a company is, you know, making a billion plus in revenue and they have, uh, you know, vendor management uh, teams and uh, they, they really want to avoid having any vendor have uh, sort of, you know, significant uh, leverage over them. But I think most of them had, have had a, and continue to have a bad experience with Oracle, for example. Now cloud spend greatly outpaces what people used to spend on Oracle. And so that is, uh, that's a big concern. And so, and so I think that, uh, you know, even if a company starts uh, on AWS, because that's where they have expertise, they are very eager uh, to, to maintain flexibility and optionality. And I, I see this increasingly with startups as well. Uh, you know, it's the, 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 mul the multi-cloud vendors are in many cases much better, sort of best of breed. And uh, you know, startups are getting a lot more aggressive in terms of uh, you know, their, both their ambitions and their um, technology stacks. And so people don't just want good enough. Like Amazon traffic's in good enough, in my opinion. Uh, certainly when it comes to databases, <laughs> I can't speak for all the other infrastructure. I mean, it's a great product, but nevertheless, you know, something like Snowflake or Cockroach or Neo4j, these are, these are products that Amazon uh, you know, trail significantly in terms of their actual, actual capabilities. Also, this new generational shift puts different requirements on the skill sets as well, right? On, on, the, on the people you know, managing your data infrastructure. What are you seeing as kind of compared to like where we were 10 years ago and where we are now? What, what, is, really, what is really the skill sets you need to have, right? Um, today to make, make that the be best decision, you know, for your company at this time? You want me to answer that, or Emil? You want to jump in? Sponsor, yeah, yeah. Uh, me. Well, you know what, what's really interesting is that uh, the skill sets, in some ways, have uh, been allowed to narrow because the the method of consumption and deployment used to be that you'd download open source and then you'd get VMs and you'd be responsible for uh, setting things up and monitoring it and you know, all the day one plus operations work would fall onto your development uh, SRE teams. And now you can consume things increasingly as services. And so uh, yeah, it, to your point, I think it is about making the right selections of technology, fitting the pieces together, but uh, it, it's more, I, I think most companies can get a lot further, a lot faster, because they're no longer responsible for uh, as much of the deployment puzzle as they were previously. Yeah, I mean, what are you seeing here? And also, uh, I want to talk a little more about sort of, you know, how, how this this more modern data stack, you know, looks like, you know, um, as well. Um, Amy, would you would well, you are pretty pretty cutting edge when it comes to to data? So. What do you think this? Uh, yeah. what do you think this modern stack will look like? Well, first, let me just piggyback off of one thing that Spencer said. One of the things that I always uh, try to do on on panels like this is I try to disagree because <laughs> that makes it uh, so much more interesting. Um, and I agree with part of what you said there, Spencer. For sure, operational complexity has been reduced, right? In the sense that you don't have to bother running all these different things. But I do see that the surface is just so much more like for anyone who wants to operate on data, we mentioned AWS before the, like they have, I don't know, 20, 30, you know, database services. And we can argue that they're at, bo at best good enough, right? You know, and this and that, right? But like, there's just this massive breadth of them. If you go back, I think you said 10 years, Denise, if you go back 10 years ago, it's like, hey, I'm a developer, I know SQL, you know, I can, I can install MySQL or I can get a Linux distro with MySQL pre-installed and like off you go type of a thing, right? Um, so, I, so I guess I see both of those, those vectors where the operational complexity is reduced um, or at least absorbed by the, the, by the cloud platforms, but the product surface broadly is, is, it is, is much bigger. Also, what you see in terms of also talking to your customers in terms of more now how the business side and the technology side, how they're collaborating, you know, within um, within the company. 
uh, and more. I think today, of course, the business side is more involved in that technology decision making as well. How have you seen that shift as well among your customers? Me, me or Spencer? <laughs> yeah, email. Let's start with email now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so to me, I think it's uh, like uh, for, for us, what we see is that there's a, a very clear demarcation here, basically when it comes to AI and ML, right? Where it, I feel like we got a little bit of that, you know, with, with big data, right? In the whatever, 10 plus years ago, right? Well, all of a sudden, it, it, data went from being something that just the geeks cared about, right? It was some underlying thing that made like IT work and you know, the business side could get, you know, laptops and POS terminals and whatever they, they needed, right? It went from that to big data all of a sudden, you know, Harvest Business Reviews wrote about it, McKinsey talked about it, right? And data is the new oil and all that kind of stuff, right? So that is, I feel like was the first step. And then AI and machine learning comes, comes along and like all of a sudden, all every single line of business executive in the world is like man digital transformation this digital transformation that we need to turn ourselves into a machine learning company and and those kind of things and all of a sudden we see them coming in talking to it and say hey so in in our universe right so i understand knowledge graphs are really important it's one of the graphs are is one of the five pillars of data science as identified by gartner right what are dear it org what are you doing about graphs? And that we did not see e even five years ago. So is it much harder to be a technologist now, right? When you have that business side being constantly involved, you know, trying to tell you what to do at this time, Spencer. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's some other interesting things that uh, we've seen with Cockroach. I mean, one of its capabilities is really that you get to do multi-region operation. And that's... Uh, that's very relevant to the business and the legal side of companies. I mean, many companies out there are uh, you know, realizing there's a bit of a minefield to do business globally. And right? if you want to, to uh, you know, work not just in the US, but you want to expand to the EU, there's uh, you know, certain requirements and certainly user preferences uh, around data sovereignty, domiciling, residency. Uh, and that is uh, you know, something that often the legal department is breathing down the neck of technology and they have been for years. Like, what are we doing with our users' data? Uh, we, you know, how are we really planning for the future? What new markets can we enter safely uh, you know, without too much liability to the business? And so, uh, yeah, technology has become this sort of IT departments, how you deploy, what your data architecture looks like has become um, you know, a much broader concern across the company. Yeah, definitely. So if we talk about sort of how this uh, new modern data stack, you know, will look like, I think that uh, maybe 10 years ago, every, every, every company almost looked the same most, for most companies. But today, I mean, campus is going to build more best of breed stacks that makes most sense for them, right? I mean, how do you see this? Are there any, you know, guidance in terms of how to look at this? Uh, Emil? Yeah, in terms of guidance, I mean, I think the it comes back to I think the first point that I that I mentioned before, like which is uh, be aware of the consideration between what, what you mentioned, which is the the best of breed technology approach versus the hey, I'm just going to do whatever is built into my, my my cloud platform, and and nothing is right or wrong there. It's just different versions of trade offs and and risks that you're that that you're willing uh, to to take on. So I think that's kind of one piece of it. I've also seen like a disproportionate influence and investment in just more architectural pieces, right? If you think about kind of the cloud native, you know, movement, if you will, with microservices on the on the development side, right? Development time side and and containers, right, on the on the runtime side, and you see serverless architectures and function as a service and and like all of that in many ways enables, at least in theory, it, it to be cheaper to plug and play services. And hey, I'm gonna, I don't need to go wholesale all in, in the previous kind of three tier architecture where I had one database behind it all. Like I had, it, replacing that one was a massive, massive thing, right? These days, at least the theory is, and. I sometimes see that realized with, with big global 2000 customers, sometimes not, but at least the theory is that you can unplug, you can experiment in a 
with with a with a with kind of with a smaller um, uh, kind of damage radius, if you will, if something goes wrong with a new type of data backend. And I think I see a, a lot more thinking and investment in that as well. Yeah, Spencer. Yeah, I mean, over the last ten years, has been a, a pretty. Uh, remarkable evolution of databases. I kind of think of it in three stages. And I guess maybe 10 years ago, we're kind of sort of, it's starting into the second phase, but for most of the world's big companies, they're still in the first. So that first stage was SQL, which has been evolving for 40 years. And the, the, those architectures were monolithic. You know, they, they sat in one place, you sort of had to scale them up. Uh, that kind of uh, ran into a brick wall when the, the web happened. And so there was just a lot of innovation that was is necessary. How do you actually build data architectures that can handle not enterprise scale, but global scale, web scales, people called it. And that, that really kicked off the NoSQL movement, which I think 10 years ago was uh, the, the, the hot, the new hotness, right? And uh, now there, we're kind of entering a, a new stage, which is we would like to marry the, the great things about the relational SQL model with the NoSQL scalability, redundancy. Uh, and that's uh, sort of the the third phase of databases, which we're well into right now. So that's that's been, you know, from the perspective uh, of someone that has you know, been paying attention to databases almost exclusively, uh, this has been a remarkable, remarkably fast evolution in the industry. Yeah. So I mean, both of you are engineers, right? As a background, right? I know Spencer, you- Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged, right? So, so, so you, you're both uh, technologies at heart. So let's talk about you know, technology considerations a little bit. And again, with all applications moving you know, to the cloud, data infrastructure has really been last, right? To make that shift you know, into the cloud. But in your opinion, how important is it for data infrastructure to be fully cloud native at this time? You know, I'm personally, of course, a bit you know, biased here also representing a company that was uh, built for the cloud uh, from the beginning. And of course, see the enormous you know, differences in between uh, that. So what, what is your, uh, what's your opinion and recommendation here in regards to that? Emil. Yeah, so a couple of things, right? I, I, I agree with you, by the way, even like, in, I guess that wasn't the question, but even a premise of the question, which I think is interesting and worth calling out, which is that this this entire shift to to let's call it public cloud more specifically, right, is this super horizontal secular trend, obviously, in, in our industry. But the shift is happening at a different pace, at different layers of the stack, right? And kind of weirdly, at least I feel like it's weird, like it started in kind of two ends. So it started with applications, right? When was when did we all start using like email in in the cloud? It's like Hotmail or whatever. It's like gazillion years ago, right? Um, and then VMs. So it's like it skipped like a bunch of layers in the stack, right? With EC2 was the first service out of out of Amazon, right? And so so those happened to go early. And I I'll be first to to admit that I was very wrong about the shift in the data layer of the stack. Like when we put together our product strategy, we just reviewed that for an internal thing in 2012, we had like, okay, we got to move to the cloud. We have to have a, the database as a service uh, available. And, and it took much, much longer, right? And, and I think it, the, the data layer of the stack was, was held back by things like data gravity, but also the stuff that, that Spencer, you talked about around regulatory concerns and like if you're a big if you have healthcare data or, you know, that kind of stuff, like you're not gonna shift that into the cloud just, just like this, right? Um, and, and that I think was, was an, an interesting and, and surprising uh, thing to me. So I've now managed to talk about just the premise of your question and through that completely forgotten your question. <laughs> what was your actual question? The, the question was around really what, around, you know, cloud native, how important, you know, is yeah. your opinion? Yes. So, so, so I, I, I go back and forth on that one, like in my, in my head, right? On, on one hand, and I, I know we have a CMO on the call, so I'll, I'll tread carefully here. I feel like it's a very marketing-y, you know, type of a, type of a term, and it's very ill-defined, which the, the engineer in me d dislikes that, that, that part. Um, I have to say, though, that I think it's, it's really important for any type of new technologies 
including databases, to be more sympathetic to underlying cloud primitives. So for example, like if you if you recall some of the early success of Elasticsearch back when it was still Elasticsearch, like one of the key things they did, which is a small, small thing, right, is that if you if you started up Elasticsearch, as it was called at the time, in AWS, everything would just work so much better. Like it, it, it auto detected a bunch of things around your availability zones and stuff like that. It, it you had to configure like 5% or so of what you had to do if you ran it run it on-prem, right? There's an equivalent thing going on right now where like you just make sure that you, simple things that you don't hard code your IPs, right? Because you want them to be injected by by your container management system and things like that. And, and that just makes it much lower friction uh, to deploy your database in, in a more cloud native type of an architecture. And I think that kind of stuff is, is, is really important. And then on a more fundamental architectural level, Things like being able to decouple storage and compute, I think, is increasingly important in a in a cloudy world. I think things are moving incredibly fast here, right? I think we've seen a massive uh, change just in the last year in terms of how financial services now is, you know, moving to the cloud, healthcare, all of that, right? So I think it's just accelerated just in the past year. Spencer, what are, what are you seeing? Absolutely, there's, you know, it, it's 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 a complex thing for the system of record, which is what cockroach is, right? And I think it's one of the last things to move for a lot of the reasons that Emil mentioned. You know, there's just InfoSec requirements, I think. Uh, you know, if you think about all of these regulated industries, especially financial services, they have uh, all kinds of compliance that they have to meet with. And that involves uh, a lot of different controls, both on how their employees interact with the data and the systems that they uh, put up. You know how they replicate, uh, what kinds of backups they have, and how quickly their sort of time to recovery is, and those have evolved over decades, right? So to just move to cloud, especially service, is very difficult for these larger companies. And so we kind of think of our mission in in, in on two fronts, and you know hopefully it's sort of a pincer movement. But on on the one side, you have to sort of what we think of as building a bridge for these big enterprises. You have to meet them where they are. And often there's a very hybrid reality. And when they get into the cloud, they really want multi-cloud, but you, you know, you can't just say, okay, everything's gonna be as a service right now, or you're never gonna get those big customers because you're not meeting them where they are. But on the other hand, I mean, Gardner thinks that uh, by 2022, this seems insane to me, honestly, but 75% of databases will be deployed or migrated to cloud platforms. And that's, that's pretty incredible. So obviously if you aren't planning for uh, you know, really all of those net new starts uh, and, you know, I guess increasingly migrations as well, then you're going to miss the boat, right? But you have to do both of those at once, which really complicates the task. Whereas Snowflake, <laughs> you guys had the, uh, I think, immense, um, you know, good fortune to just start in the cloud, to be born just strictly as a service. I think that uh, that that's, you know, complicates our, our world that we have to um, sort of do that self-hosted side and also, uh, build a, a cloud service, but you know, fundamentally, these cloud native technologies are uh, you know, enabling companies to get three huge benefits. Right? And, and I kind of mentioned that within a data center, it's about scaling horizontally um, across data centers, especially availability zones that are fairly close together. You can replicate so that you just have complete business continuity. And then I think the the real exciting thing for the 2020s is building for the edge. Right, the idea that you know even startups right out of the gate just getting product market fit they can end up with customers in brazil or in turkey or in japan right and you want those you don't know where you're going to get that critical mass and you'd like to be able to operate in a way that keeps the data in their legal jurisdiction uh, sometimes it's an actual hard requirement certainly is a user preference uh, and you want to to optimize for latency fundamentally you don't want your Australian users that love your product to have to jump across to Virginia to a data center. And that's never going to give them that 100 millisecond latency rule that you, you always want to uh, optimize for. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very clear why companies uh, want to embrace cloud native. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting set of challenges when you are the system of record and, uh, you know, the, the a lot of the customers that you'd like to get uh, just can't simply uh, start everything new in the cloud. Yeah. I, 
I, I really want to, to disagree. Unfortunately, I agree with every single thing you just uh, said there. Uh, I would add to that that I 100% agree that one of the things that, Spencer, that you and I have to do right now is um, running a startup, kind of high growth, tr at the same time, go through the organizational transformation of being able to do both on-prem and cloud at the same time, which is freaking hard, <laughs> right? Um, and, and Denise, you didn't have to do that because you started in the cloud, which is, I think, an amazing um, advantage from that perspective. I think the flip side, and then this is me being an entrepreneur and seeing the glass half full, right? The flip side is that I do think that developers today, probably also data scientists, but at least developers today, they do want a local experience. So if, if I would have started all over again in 2020 from scratch, uh, I for sure would have made it cloud first, but I also would have built like a let's call it like a desktop or a laptop experience, maybe not kind of a server on-prem one, but at least that I would have, I would have uh, done. Is that what you would have done as well, Spencer? Yeah, actually that's a really great point because Google Spanner, which uh, you know, works very nicely within Google and then they made a, a cloud product. That's something that you, you simply can't run on your laptop. And in, in the years that it's been out, it, 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 I think it took them several, they kind of have a little emulator that you can run locally. Uh, but yeah, having something that works on a laptop as well as uh, you know, expanding you know, to massive sizes in the cloud, I think that uh, is requirement for developers in, in order for them to be on a plane, for example, and do their development and so forth. So yeah. yeah and just that local kind of rapid iterative experience and then I think the other thing that so that's kind of on the developer side and then on the CIO side at least for us I, interesting to hear how uh, what, what you see but for us being able to talk to a CIO and say that hey we run everywhere right like we run in your data centers if you want to hybrid cloud environments in whichever public cloud on your developers laptops that pervasiveness argument is also has also been really really strong, and it comes back to that whole multi cloud, all eggs in one basket type of a thing. Yeah, no, I, I, we we've definitely seen the same thing, but you know, as we've already pointed out, it's uh, it's a lot, you know, from the support side, for example, and from engineering, there's just a it's a much broader swath of problems to tackle. Yeah. Both of you have a lot of experience, you know, with open source as well. So where do you see open source play in, in the future? Can we get anything contradicting here from you, Emil? Let's start with Spencer and see what, you know, Emil have to say about it. It's good if I go first, because then Emil can disagree with me. I can find something to disagree with. <laughs> let's, let's argue licenses. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually do think that open source remains incredibly important. Uh, and that's really from my perspective as a developer. I wouldn't use a database that wasn't open source in 2020. It just uh, it feels wrong to me. Uh, that said, you know, open source took over the world, not necessarily because of the ideals of uh, having the source code available. I mean, that's sort of more the open source purist perspective. It took over the world because it was a far more efficient consumption model. And previous to open source, it was absurd what you had to do. There was no community, you get printed manuals, you'd spend months with vendor management trying to negotiate some sort of sales contract. Uh, it was you know, a very slow process. Open source changed everything. So developers can simply uh, go online, download the things, run them and so forth. Uh, look, you know, search on Google, find a Stack Overflow answer that gives them the exact recipe that they're looking for to get what they want to get done. Uh, but now open source, that consumption model, so much better than what came before. There's a better one now, right? Which is to consume services. So again, it's like, you know, we mentioned this before, but now a developer gets to simply work on the API of something they want to work with, uh, as opposed to having to actually understand how to run it. And, and, you know, much less if you actually had to put in production, there's just a, there's, there's a lot of uh, details in terms of how to successfully and responsibly run something in production. So now I'd say that we've got a new consumption model for the you know, 2010s, 2020s, which is as a service. So how does that, how does, what's the interplay with that and open source? And that's a very interesting question. I think that the best services are ones that are based on open source, um, based pretty strictly on the open source. In fact, I don't like when people put a lot of special sauce 
on top of the open source that uh, makes the service very different from what it would look like if you ran it yourself on your laptop. I think it's best if those two things have a, a, a very uh, a high degree of symmetry. Uh, and you know, I, I do think that there is also this idea of open source, which it's the free beer side of open source, right? Developers do not like paying for things. Developers do not like putting credit cards down. So what you really want to do is have a service that's based on open source and also have a, an extremely powerful uh, free tier so that uh, developers can just not just kick the tires, but get hobby projects, hackathons. You know, these are, this is like the top of funnel. You know, the thing that we've come you know, face to face with uh, in, you know, more and more frequently is that developers make decisions. And every company in the world, from the smallest to the largest, it's just developers all the way down, right? So if you can capture Mindshare with developers, uh, it can make a very efficient sales engine. And, and, and that's what you know, we're all looking for in terms of making our companies a success. And I know, Emil, that you're not going to have much contradicting views on this one. You think I was going to say, tragically, I agree yes. with, with <laughs> all of that. Um, but, but I guess the, the, the only thing, agreeing 100% with what Spencer said, I would add, um, at least the way that I think about open source is kind of the high order bit um, for, not even the high order bit, but the kind of the higher order view for me on open source is that what open source, the, the, the business objective that it serves for the vendor, right, um, is it's basically a self-serve approach, right? And I think what we've seen, this is Saster, right? So I'm going to assume there's a bunch of startup founders and, and executives in the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the audience, right? And we've now have objective data on the fact that uh, product-led growth companies on balance grow faster than ones that are, that are sales-led, um, which makes intuitive sense, I think, to at, le at least to me, right? Because it's just a better customer journey, right? If you if you can talk to a human being, but you're not forced to do it, right? You know that's that's a better customer experience. So it makes sense that that one wins out over the long term. And open source, the way that I now look at open source is that it really is self serve first or product led growth, specifically for on prem with B two D businesses, so business to developer businesses. So if you go in and in through developers and you live in an on prem world, right? That's what open source is, source is, right? And then agreeing with Spencer, right? The, like an even more powerful thing then is if you can, if you already have that product surface, you can self onboard onto it, right? If you can then re remove the operational pieces completely, that's an even more powerful combination. Um, and so, so I think the there is that tight interplay between um, open source and and uh, and cloud when it comes to developer facing products like databases. So we're gonna jump into the next topic here before we take some questions from the audience because we have questions you know, coming in at this time. And uh, it's always exciting to talk to two founders like the two of you, obviously. And I know you have a lot of advice to share with other entrepreneurs just kind of entering um, this whole data space. So um, what would your main advice be if there are any other founders here that now have new, new products in the whole data infrastructure space? What, what would your advice you know, be for them at this time, um, Spencer? Yeah, I've got a ton of advice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, and certainly I, I, I would, I'm a big proponent of having co-founders, at least one. Uh, and you shouldn't just choose someone that uh, you, you've known for a month or two. Ideally, it's someone that you've worked with in a past incarnation uh, pretty extensively. You've been in the trenches. I just think, uh, you know, being a sole founder and you know, presumably the CEO is a pretty lonely job. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to have, uh, you know, long term colleagues there there with you. Uh, also, you know, I think a mistake that a lot of people make, and it's certainly not limited to the, the data infrastructure space, uh, I think this applies to essentially everything. People, people get very cagey about the, the value of an idea, right? They think that, uh, you know, someone's, if, if, boy, if they don't get people to sign NDAs and they're worried about, you know, VCs talking, uh, and, and so they, they, create this bubble around themselves. And there's not a lot of uh, good, you know, maybe very contradictory advice coming in. 
And uh, I think that's a good way to uh, you know, spend a lot of time and effort uh, only to fail slowly instead of to fail quickly or to evolve quickly. And so I, you know, my, my advice to everyone is do not believe that your idea is somehow you know, worth anything. Ideas are cheap, they are very cheap. Whatever idea you have, someone else has had it. You wanna get out and tell everyone about your idea. That should involve like, Hacker News, right? Like if you can get on the front page of Hacker News, believe me, you will get so much more interesting support. You'll get people that wanna join your company. You'll get VCs interested. So you wanna, you wanna blog and you wanna write, you wanna tweet, you wanna, you really wanna get the word out there. I mean, I love talking to VCs personally. I, I'll talk to any one of them that, uh, that's interested uh, because they really are mostly pretty smart and some are like incredibly smart and having them disagree with one of your ideas or give you, uh, you know, uh, either complimentary feedback or, uh, you know, uh, even potentially, you know, hey, I think this idea is not so great and maybe you should consider doing this uh, is, is very valuable. Like if you can't address uh, the criticisms that come your way from smart people, uh, you're going to build the wrong product fundamentally. So I, I think, uh, yeah, just be very open. Sunshine on your idea makes it stronger. So you need to be a strong communicator yourself, obviously, but also listen a lot uh, to, to advice. Well, Emil, I don't think you're going to contradict this one either, right? You, you... Well, I'm work, trying really hard, but that was, that was, so, that was so right. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I do agree with all that. Um, I'd add two things, one, one big and one small. Um, the big one is that you, I, I, I also actually like talking to VCs and I love getting advice especially when it's advice from people uh, that I that, where I don't have to take the advice because I ignore 95 plus percent uh, of, of the advice but I love getting it and and, and hearing it um, but you're gonna get a lot of advice on stuff that that you should be doing the one thing that I've found over the whatever 10 plus years now is that it is impossible to over index on customer empathy like the more time you can spend with customers with the users of, like and just you should be able in the early days, you should be able to just paint a perfect picture of your ideal user's day. What do they do when they wake up? What site, Spencer mentioned Hacker News, where do they go to get their information? Just understanding absolutely everything about them, right? So I think that that would be kind of the, the big one. I think the small one, I guess, you just asked specifically about kind of entrepreneurship in, in the data space. It comes back to what I said before around self-serve first or, or product-led growth, just investing in getting the product to such a state where you can self-onboard, which is a product thing, but it's also the entire company, right? Like you have to have documentation, you have like there's just all kinds of aspects that go into it. But that is, that is um, an investment that will compound over the years in ways that almost uh, very few other things will, will do, maybe outside of like people internal things like culture is also one another thing that that compounds but in terms of strategy just investing in that self-service um, piece uh, in the data space i think is really important i mean you both made um a couple of large funding rounds um, yourself any advice you have to anyone here um who's looking for vc uh funding and uh, i'm happy to answer that. Um, I, I think one thing to do is just to be scrupulously honest and straightforward. I, I, I usually don't play cards close to my chest. I, I really can over communicate. And I, I think that's just a mark of respect and uh, VCs appreciate it. Uh, certainly if you're trying to make a VC round come together, it really helps to have an anchor term sheet. <laughs> so if you can get somebody to, to, to go in, even if it's not necessarily who you uh, most would like as, as your lead, uh, that that really precipitates the round. Um, but again, it's it's not something that I, I would ever recommend you you get cagey about. Like you don't really have the term sheet or the commitment. You can't say you do. And I think that uh, you know, just being uh, very above board in everything you do and uh, very straightforward, it just pays off. People, it, it's not actually very common apparently. Uh, but uh, if you do do that, you will. Uh, build the right kind of relationship with the, the VCs that, that do lead you around. Uh, you know, like having something that's uh, maybe a, a little bit um, adversarial 
in that process, uh, you know, can leave lasting echoes that that can affect what you know needs to be a very strong relationship. Because this, you know, likely someone's going to be on your board, and it's going to be next ten years. And you, you really want that person to be uh, someone that you you trust and that, that and, and that they trust you. And Emil, I, I sit on your board, so I see how what incredible um, collaboration and relationship you have with your investors, um, right? Yeah, I I love all that that Spencer said, and I I, I approach it uh, just try hard to approach it in the in in the same way. I, I'd say there are two vectors that I that are the most important ones for me when it, in in the past for for choosing investors. One has been, and I think very related to what you said, Spencer, which is it, that personal chemistry, right? Like it's, it's I'm, I'm a relationship guy, like I'm a graph database guy. It's all about relationships and data. And I'm a relationship person as well, you know, in, 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 in life, right? And so, so that part is really important because it really allows that kind of vulnerability-based trust where I can come to them as like, all right, I fucked up over here, or like this this thing is broken, or whatever it it it, it may be, right? So that one is is really important, right? That personal chemistry, and then the second vector, people call it in in the visa world like conviction investors or something like that, right? Basically, you can find people who fall in love with your metrics, right? Or you can find people who love fall in love with you and the idea and what you want to achieve, and I've always chosen the latter right like i want people who who believe right um and, and that's a personal preference i could have gotten fancier valuations or whatever without that probably but those are the two axes at least that i've that i've looked at yeah i actually think that i, I just want to uh, reiterate that last point i think that's it's incredibly wise uh you know you, you the last thing you want in my opinion is is it an investor that you have to convince that your idea is a good one? Because that 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 person, anyone that you have to convince, isn't isn't approaching the idea as a good idea from first principles. So they're not going to give you anything beyond agreeing with you if you convince them. If you get somebody that says, "I've been looking for something like this. I've got my own theories. Maybe it's you know not exactly yours, but almost certainly it's going to be complementary." And that's someone that can really give you sustained advice because they've reached similar conclusions about the space. Yeah. We're going to take a question from the audience here. And this is a question that you are getting um, all the time. And the question is, what prevents Amazon to take your open source and make a new multi-cloud Aurora DB? A lot of startups and investors are mindful uh, of this, and I'm sure you get that question all the time in regards to Amazon. Or Never Amazon. thought about that. <laughs> Do you want to go go first, Spencer? Yeah, I'll uh, try to keep it brief. Uh, the you know we we've struggled with that. We when we started, we were very much the open core model, and it looked like it was a great model, right? Elastic had done a good job with it. I think they're, they're the ones we were paying the most attention to. And, it felt like, uh, okay, you can have a very strong open source core and you can build a constellation of enterprise features around that. And as long as you draw the line appropriately in terms of what's... Yep, you're still here. On here, Something just went away from me. Oh, there we go. As long as you draw the line appropriately, that can be, uh, I think, very uh, strong model. Amazon kind of found the loophole in there and they sort of punctured the model. Uh, and the way they did that is they open sourced, uh, you know, Elastic's security features, which was kind of their firewall to get people to pay. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, yeah, Amazon open sourced it. It's almost like that's altruistic. But in fact, what they did is they took uh, a, a lot of the wind out of the sails of the company that was actually investing in the open source project. So it was, I think, very predatory. Um, but you know what? It's, uh, you know, all's fair. So what we did is, is in response to that, we, we decided to relicense our core. And we chose what's called the business source license, the BSL, which is something that Maria DB came up with and has sort of two uh, blanks that you fill in. One is the term, and then, uh, and then you also set a list of exclusions that uh, apply over the course of the term. So our term is three years. So for three years, we have uh, on the core uh, one exclusion which is that you can't run Cockroach as a commercial externally available database as a service. So it's uh, in some ways the anti-Amazon RDS exclusion. Uh, you know, otherwise you can do everything with it. All the 
open source codes available. Uh, you can fork it. You could resell Cockroach as a shrink wrap subscription software. You can run it as a database as a service internally. You just can't do it externally. Uh, after those three years, then Cockroach becomes Apache again. So the BSL only applies for three years. And then uh, you know, at that three year mark, three years after every uh, release, kind of in a rolling fashion, uh, it leads, leaves a pure open source legacy of Apache. So that's um, you know, three years innovation window. It's kind of like a little bit of patent protection. Um, our customers don't have a problem with it. In fact, I think they're quite supportive of it. Hacker News, uh, there was you know, pretty great reception for it. There wasn't a lot of uh, naysayers. I think some of the open source purism uh, you know, has given way to a, a fundamentally more expansive idea of, okay, if we want this open source to keep getting developed the way that a company like Cockroach develops it, then they have to have a sustainable business model. And uh, the, the one that we had originally settled on, where we could have just a pure Apache core from the beginning uh, of each release, just uh, you know, it doesn't work with uh, you know, some of the um, evolution of uh, you know, Amazon's uh, approach to open source. And I'll turn over to you, Emil, to, to close this you know, for us, because this is obviously a question that all, all other Hey everyone, look, there, there are only two certainties in life, like I usually say this, like one is we're all going to die and the second one is we're all going to compete with Amazon and I'm not even sure about the first one. <laughs> um, so look, I, mean, I guess the, I, I, so we've done a very similar, not technically the same license, but very similar approach. We have a different license where Amazon can't take our, our, our product and run it um, them, themselves. Um, and I think for us, I guess the perspective I would take is that like when Amazon starts to compete with you, I think there's a big fork in the road, right? So Amazon enters your product category. Are they able to enter your product category with your product or do they have to enter with another product, right? And where like the elastic, where many of these other firms are not Cockroach, not Neo4j, not Snowflake, like is that they've entered your product category with your own product. And that's a world of pain. It is just horrible, right? But if you enter your product category with a different product, right? As long as that product is nowhere near as good as yours, which typically it isn't because your entire company is focused on that one, one product. And because of how early in the days you over-indexed on customer empathy, you built a much greater product, right? Then at that point, it's actually net positive when they entered the graph database space, it was one of the key accelerators of the entire space because Amazon is temporarily a, a bigger company than Neo4j, right? So they can get the word out, right? Um, and so, so we actually saw that as a very positive sign when Amazon entered into our, in, into our space with a, with a competing product. But that's because we were able to, from a legal perspective, from an IP perspective, stop them from doing that with our own product while remaining open source. Exactly, yeah. So uh, I wanna thank both of you for a very interesting discussion. I wanna thank um, the audience as well. I think we need to give everyone a little break here to go to the next session. So thank you both. And um, um, I think people can find you on, on both LinkedIn and, and Twitter if they have any additional you know, questions for you. But thank you so much. and. Um, have a good evening, Emil. Thanks, Denise. Thank you, Denise. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks, Spencer.